In this second part of the lecture, I'm going to talk about the different information sources that we might use to come up with new ideas or help us identify opportunities. And one of the key things I'd say up front is that if we're going to be effective at identifying new ideas and opportunities, it's critical that entrepreneurs stay attuned to the forces that shape their operating environment. I think it, if you look at the most successful entrepreneurs across industries, one of the uh, most common and defining characteristics we see of these people is their level of engagement and interaction with the market in which they compete. They're constantly looking at the market, looking at the forces that surround that market because they're not blind to the fact that their market is embedded within other systems. And they're constantly trying to think about where the next opportunities and threats are going to come for their organisation. And so again, being open to information and gathering that information from the widest number of possible sources is likely to enable us to be more effective at identifying new ideas. And it's really important that um, effective entrepreneurs rely on multiple sources of information, um, both internal and external to the organisation, to really develop a well-rounded picture of what the market potential looks like. So what I'm saying here is that we're trying to achieve some sort of triangulation. We're trying to look at a phenomena of interest and say, OK, well, if we can see that this opportunity um, is discussed or looked at from this perspective and this perspective, and it matches with the organisation's resources, then we know that we're getting a well-rounded picture of what is actually happening in the industry. Say, for example, you're um, an entrepreneur and you're looking at technology change within the computer industry. You'd be trying to use a number of different sources to gauge what the future direction of technology change might look like in the computer industry. So some of the things you'd be doing would be looking at your own internal records and sort of maybe thinking about what your product line has developed like to, over time and how it has changed. You might talk to suppliers and distributors and try and get an idea from them uh, as to what they see as being the big challenges and changes that are likely to occur within the industry in the future. You might talk to industry experts and users of the products and um, find out from them what they think the next stages of evolution and development might be within the industry and what new ideas might sell well to the customer base. You might also look at a range of different trade publications and talk to your competitors and think about what all the different um, information is telling you about that industry at any one point in time. So really, to be effective at idea generation, you have to be open to information and you have to gain information from multiple sources. We also know that idea generation and opportunity assessment is commonly conducted as a group based activity. So it tends to be done in teams. And the reason that this is so is that often multiple perspectives help us to create a fuller and richer picture of an opportunity. What we know is that each individual human is slightly different. And the way that they will view a situation or a context will differ slightly from one another. And so if we bring multiple people to bear on a situation, we'll get a richer and deeper understanding of what all the different perspectives are relating to that problem. And often what we'd encourage to be effective at idea generation is that you try and foster team diversity. The more diverse the base of people you have working on a problem, the more likely you are to come up with innovative, interesting solutions. So for example, if we look at um, health, for example, as a, a domain where new ideas and concepts come out regularly, and we're interested in improving everyone's overall health and well-being. Now, the most obvious thing to do would be to build a team of healthcare practitioners and have them come up with a range of strategies that would encourage people to improve their overall level of health. The problem is that doctors all tend to think alike and they come at the problem with a purely medical focus in terms of trying to solve what the problem is. What we'd probably be better doing is putting together a group of people from a number of different backgrounds. So, for example, sports people, um, psychologists, medical doctors, community health practitioners, social workers, government agencies, business people and the general public to come up with a more um, nuanced response to that particular situation. And I think what we'd see is that our solutions would be more engaging. 
So again, I think um, doing your problem solving, doing your idea generation in a team and getting a lot of different diverse ex um, perspectives on the problem is a critical part to being effective in this process. And one thing I'll say up front in the idea generation and problem solving process is we must avoid saying no up front. Um, it's very, very easy when someone puts up a new idea to shut it down immediately and say, oh, that's just silly. That's never going to work. Why would we bother wasting our time um, engaging in and pursuing that particular idea? But the problem we have is that none of us are experts about the future. None of us know for sure that the, you know, that opportunity or that idea won't actually present itself. And so we need to really avoid discrediting ideas and opportunities too early in the process because we might find that some of these ideas that seem a little bit out of left field and a little bit crackpot might actually be the ones that take us forward into the future. So I'm going to just quickly talk about um, the different sources of information we might get. And basically what I've done is to break them down into internal sources, so sources that are within our organisation, and external sources, so sources that sit outside of our business. Now, when we think internally, what we're talking about here is trying to pull together the brain power and expertise and knowledge of the people working for our organisation and getting them to focus on identifying new ideas and opportunities that the organisation might take advantage with. And a really important part of innovation and research and development within a business is finding the space for us to regularly engage in these processes of internal idea generation. And so what you'll see is that often organisations will have um, periodic uh, breaks from normal operating procedures where they'll get together and kick around ideas to um, see what actually comes out of that idea process. Uh, similarly, a lot of organisations will actually allow their staff to have sabbaticals or break from their normal work and where they can just go off and think about new ideas and concepts that might be of relevance to their organisation. So idea generation can be left to chance. You might be lucky enough to have someone who just suddenly comes upon a bright idea one day while they're working and they decide to run that idea through the organisation and we get to take advantage of it. But that's a pretty um, seat of the pants, leaving it to chance approach to idea generation. What I would actually argue is that any organisation, whether it's a new startup, whether it's an existing business, should engage in formal processes of idea generation. And there's a number of different um, techniques that might be used, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about all of these. Um, there's lots of good information of these available uh, online. There's books and process models that are available. Um, but I would encourage you to use a couple of different approaches to help you as an organisation generate ideas. So for example, um, brainstorming is a commonly used method for coming up with new ideas and concepts. Okay, so what you get, you do is you get everyone together and you get them to simply kick around the idea and talk about it and to come up with whatever ideas might cross their mind. You list them all before you actually go through a process of evaluating whether those ideas are going to be positive and pro um, ideas for us to actually solve. You might also get people in the organisation to engage in a mind mapping exercise. So, you know, going through, putting all their thoughts down on paper and mapping out the linkages that they think exist between different areas of knowledge. And what we often find through that mind mapping process is we're able to identify new linkages, new ideas that haven't been seen previously, and that open up, opens up opportunities for the organisation. There's also um, a number of more formalised um, processes that can be used within organisations. And um, one of the um, more commonly used approaches and adopted by many entrepreneurs is the process of lateral thinking. Lateral thinking um, avoids the linearity that we normally approach um, problems with and says, let's look at this problem from different perspectives. Let's break the problem down, think about all the different elements and see if we can actually come up with a different solution that's a little bit outside the box. So again, there's lots of good lateral thinking exercises you can do in groups and teams that will help you to come up with new ideas. Another model of um, idea generation, which was developed by Edward de Bono, is what's called the six hat thinking approach. And what de Bono said, realized was that um, part of the problem in idea generation is that people have problems in stepping out of their own personal frame of reference when they think about a problem. 
And so to get people to do that, to get people to think differently, he came up with a model where he identified six colored hats, you know, a range of different colors from, you know, black, blue, green, yellow. And each of these hats comes with an associated thinking process. So for example, if you put on the black hat, you might be asked to think about um, a problem in the negative context and to continually view that product in a, uh, that idea or situation in a negative way. And then other people will wear different colored hats and that requires them to think about a problem in a very different perspective. And then what you do is rotate those hats around so everyone gets an opportunity to view the problem from different perspectives. Now, an individual can do this. It doesn't have to be done as a group. You can do it yourself as an individual or you can do it in teams to actually generate a range of really interesting ideas. And again, what we find is through this approach to thinking is that we, gener we generate multifaceted solutions to problems. Another commonly used technique um, and one that's sort of gained a lot of currency in the last five to 10 years is this notion of blue sky thinking. Uh, blue sky thinking is again, it's a bit like six hats. It comes at the problem and says, well, the problem we have in an organization is people have um, a lot of activities that are going on. They're sort of bound up in day-to-day -day organizational opportunities. And that tends to prevent them from being able to step back and look at problems in greater detail and from different perspectives. And so what we advocate in a blue sky thinking approach is that people switch off the active part of their brain. They step away from the business, often to a completely different space. And they think about the problem um, from without all of those existing baggage. They imagine that that doesn't exist. So just imagine we've got a blank slate, a big blue sky where anything is possible. And what we do is we actually go about trying to take advantage of those opportunities that we might um, be able to come up with. It's a bit like um, organized daydreaming and daydreaming itself is actually a common form of idea generation. Um, we do tend to find and research shows us that people's um, problem solving part of the brain tends to actually become more active and come up with more novel and innovative solutions, the less you formally try to think about a problem. And you've probably all had this situation before when you know, you've been mulling over something in mind for a long, long period of time. And then you go off and do something unrelated to that problem and you know you switch off the formal functional part of your brain and then all of a sudden an idea will come to you. And so again, any idea generation process should try and foster those things. So what we need to do in an organizational context is to ensure we create a learning organization which has very effective processes in place for knowledge management. Again, research tends to show us that organizations that have a heavy emphasis on learning and knowledge creation tend to be the ones that are most effective at coming up with new ideas and concepts. We also then need to think about some of the external sources that we use to gain information. And again, there's lots of different external sources and um, you can use you know, all or a few or one of these different approaches. Again, I'd probably advocate for using as many because the more rounded picture you get of a context, the better able you are to come up with an idea or an opportunity. So what are some of the sources? Uh, we might get um, information from some sort of external assistant, assistance provider, like a consultant or a mentoring agency. Um, some businesses will, include, will hire the services of what are called futurists. So a futurist is someone who professionally spends their life dreaming about new ideas and new concepts. We might get um, new ideas from industry and market information. So many um, industrial groups, uh, so for example, the mining in industry will uh, regularly publish um, data and information and reports that relate to that particular industry. Or you might find that there are market reports. So companies like IBIS, for example, um, Dun & Bradstreet, regularly produce market information reports that organizations can access and review, which might help them to gain new information about the market. Remember that as a business, particularly a small business, um, it's really difficult for you to go out and do extensive research, particularly in the startup phase. And so using the services of these professional bodies helps you to actually do that. Trade associations are a very important source of new information and ideas for organisations. This is particularly true when you're looking to move into new markets or new countries. Um, one of the first things you should do is talk to the local trade associations to get a picture of what industry competition looks like at any point in time. 
We might also make use of trade publications. So in many industries, there are regular magazines and newsletters that are published relating to those industries or trade, trade areas. And by reviewing those and reading those, you're able to identify specific trends or issues that are emerging in that context, which may provide you with new ideas for what you could do in the future. So for example, if you look at the travel and tourism industry, there's a number of um, leading publications that are designed for industry practitioners to keep them up to date with what's happening in the industry. You can look at other external sources like um, your competitors and looking at their um, company and product information. Um, many companies these days put a lot of information about themselves onto corporate websites. Um, I think sometimes uh, too much and smart organisations uh, regularly will data mine their um, competitors' websites to try and get access to as much relevant information about what they're up to as they possibly can. So looking at your competitors' news items, looking at their websites, looking at their corporate annual reports, looking at their product specifications and features, does give you a bit of an indication about what they think are the current trends and likely trends into the future. You can get general information from doing web-based searches. Um, so there's lots of online portals that provide you with information, particularly um, a lot of government agencies um, have portals that provide relevant information that might help you to identify market or industry ideas. And of course, you can use search engines like Google. Um, it's amazing how much information you're able to get um, from just surfing the internet in a short period of time. So again, what I encourage you to think about is using a range of these information sources to help you to generate new ideas. To wrap up this section on information sources and idea generation, I'd just like to say a couple of quick words about big data and deep data. Now certainly most of you will have heard of this concept of big data, but today um, with greater digitisation of information, with more um, business being done through electronic means, what we see is that there are large volumes of data which are being generated every day about companies, about markets and about customers. And so what we need to do as an organisation is be very skilled at actually analysing this data and ensuring that um, we have a good volume of data about what's happening at the, in the marketplace at any one point in time. Think about the point of sales data that a retailer like Coles or Woolworths generates every day. You know, 90% of their purchases will be done digitally through a scanner. A lot of the payment these days, probably the majority of payment is not done by cash, but is done by credit card. And all of these data points are potentially useful for the organisation. Um, there's a famous example of Target in the United States who identified a group of 24 products that women tended to buy when they were pregnant. And what they did was they analysed their scanner data and any customers who regularly bought nine or more of these products in a shopping session would get sent vouchers for baby products because they identified if they were buying these products, then they were probably going to be either pregnant or just had a child. So with big data, what we try to do is gain as much information as we can about the market. We try to look for trends, patterns and associations within that data. Now, big data is not without its problems. Um, some would say that we have so much data today, we've actually created a situation of information overload, that there's actually too much information for businesses to make effective, sound business decisions. And so um, the volume of data can be a little bit overwhelming. The other problem with big data is it's very good at tell you, telling you about what is currently happening. So it gives you snapshot data about what's happening at a particular point in time. The problem with big data though is it doesn't tell you a lot about why. Okay, There's no causality in the data, it's just telling you what's actually happening. And so again, there's a, there can be too much of a focus on what people are currently doing and not enough analysis of what's happening in the future. Moving beyond big data, people are starting to talk about the notion of deep data or deep analytics. That what we need to do is now plunge down into this data and to actually mine this data and conduct complex analysis on this data to identify more nuanced and predictable patterns of behaviour within an industry. And so it's that, that ability to balance up the volume of data with a deep detailed analysis that tells us enough about a rich picture of what's happening within a particular industry or market. 
So certainly for organisations looking to innovate, looking to be entrepreneurial, it's important that they gain access to the, as much data as they possibly can and also the right types of data. I mean, again, you don't want to be overburdened with data that is of no relevance to making business decisions. So in the next part of the lecture, what I'm going to go on and talk about is the, the um, search for international opportunities and why entrepreneurs might choose to move into international markets.